Hello, football family. Welcome in to Huddle It Up Films, NFL Draft, Barbecue, Big Board Questions. Mr. Cole Jackson joining us. You may have known him. I followed Cole for a long time. Way back on the message boards, Cole, at RSR. Great White North Raven. Am I correct on that? That's right? correct, man. That's it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a message board lurker. I, I tend to, if I get in there, I get baited in by somebody who's trying to bait me. <laughs> and then I end up not wanting to put, put the typewriter down or whatever typewriter, the keyboard down. So, um, yeah, I'm just a lurker, but I've known you for a while and, of course, admire your work to you guys watching football. As a matter of fact, Cole, take it over and tell the people where they can find you in case they don't know know your work. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm always doing stuff on the timeline on Twitter at Cole Jackson FB over on YouTube at Two Guys Watching Football. And I just got done uh, adding a very small piece to a massive project, which was led by James Ogden. Uh, who I know has been on this show. He's been on my show. Um, and he just put it out on redstarbaltimore.com. Uh, Jason will drop the link down below. It's the 2022 NFL draft guide for Baltimore Ravens fans. Uh, I was able to add, I keep saying I added 5%. James did over a hundred profiles. I added about 10. So it was uh honor to join him, but it's, it's a, it's a fantastic piece of work. It's, it's it's in depth. I mean, you can read one page and really understand what you're getting from a player. It's true traits based analysis. Um, I I had to really, you know, it was great for me because I had to really dial in my game to uh, to meet the expectations of someone who's graduated from the scouting academy. So I was honored to to join James, and so go check that out. It's it's a fantastic piece of work. Yeah, I can't I can't stress that enough for anybody that's watching the intro here. The links below. Check out James's stuff. It's Raven centric. It gets into some of the intangibles and most importantly, how the player would fit into the Ravens system, which is it, the more you watch Cole, the more you understand that that has a lot to do with it. Some players don't fit here, or maybe they. It's not that they wouldn't fit here. It's just that they would fit better somewhere else. Like I, I look at the uh, defensive end class, the edge class here. And a lot of these guys, Cole, are like they're four or three basically defensive ends. And to ask them to play more on the inside might be a struggle. To ask them to stand up might be a struggle. So those are teams, you know, other teams other than the Ravens will probably prioritize them. So James goes into all that. Cole was able to help him out with a lot of the offensive line stuff. If you guys know Cole, uh, one of the reasons I lean on him all the time is for his offensive line expertise. Things have changed a lot, Cole, since I was going to academies and clinics and stuff like that. They have one in my home school, Dundalk, coming up soon uh, with a lot of colleges. I'm trying to tweak that out. So tweet out, my boys, if you ever see it. I told you we got that that 6'6 offensive, that left tackle we have, Chimdy. Um, right, right. Yeah, man. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, five, six, seven years from now, we'll be able to scout him and talk about him on the program. But, uh, but Cole, more important business, sir. Okay. Now, this is a barbecue. I had the Haitian sensation on the other day, Winslow. Winslow was talking about barbecues in Hades and all the nice rum they have down there and, you know, goat and all this other stuff that I have no idea what's going on. Now, you are our neighbor to the north in Canada. Uh, so what is like, are you guys I want to know, too, are you guys into barbecuing as much as it seems like we are? And then what's it like? What are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you listening to up there? Our friendly neighbor to the north. So the beauty of our barbecue, well, I'll say the unique piece of our barbecue season is obviously we have to deal with the winter. And I mean, you guys get winter too, so it's not like winter's just in Canada. But I mean, we have a lot of snow and we have a lot of snow for large periods of time. Like it just snowed this morning and it's April 19th. Um, so the nice thing is, you, you know, you the key to a good barbecue in Canada, if you if you're a backyard barbecue person, you need to have the right setup in your backyard. And what I mean by that is you need some sort of. So I have a, a lifted deck that goes off my patio door at the back, and I have a nice little kind of encampment to the right where I have a natural gas hookup. And so I got a natural gas barbecue. And so the beauty is snow, obviously will pile up on the deck. You shovel out, you know, I have to shovel a little path for the dog and, but you have a natural cooler. And so that is what makes it great. So you go out there, you get in your, your winter gear, you're ready to barbecue. You just take your beers and you pop them right into the snow. You don't need a cooler. You got a cooler right there with the snow. So I, I, my, my alcohol game has, has, a, has evolved recently. I used to be a tried and true 
I, I drank mostly Canadian, like, like you'd see in an ad to come to Canada. Um, so I've, I've adjusted. I'm now on the Michelob Ultras. I'm trying to cut some weight. Um, and I've got, I've become a big, uh, and this is completely me falling for the hockey culture. Uh, Spit and Chicklets put out that pink Whitney vodka. Um, I drink it all the time. I literally can't drink enough of it. Uh, I also camp in the summer. I have a trailer that um, I love getting up there with my little girl and just kind of being outdoors and getting away from, you know, there's no TVs and it's kind of, it's in a, it's in like an old school trailer park. Um, but it's, it's just like kind of a, a, a vacation getaway. And so I got a barbecue set up up there and I mean, I'm just a tried and true burger guy. Um, I love looking up recipes, different things to add in. Um, I came up with this one. Well, I didn't come up with this. I copied this one last year with, you know, chopped up refined bacon thrown in with cheddar cheese into the mix. Um, with this, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, uh, barbecue sauce, and you just mix it all up, pack your own burgs, and delish. But I'm telling you, the unique thing is the outdoor cooler, which is Canadian winter. <laughs> See, I like that. I like that. We used to do that uh, here to get our beers colder than the fridge. When it snows, and it's like, right. well, with like uh, we would have you know big parties back in the day or whatever, and there's only so much space in the fridge, and then – of course, you always got the people at the party that steal your beer, you know, yeah. borrow one from yours. So we would just like find a spot outside and be like, you know, it's colder out here. Nobody will find it. So I, I can I, I can relate to that. And Cole, just from, a, you know, a, just from your statement there, it sounds like you're growing up a little bit. You know, your tastes are changing. You're turning in, turning into a man, old, maybe old man, you know, at uh what dare yeah, the I gray, say? Gray hair is coming out, man. Got That's the gray, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> kids do it to you. And, you know, you have that beautiful little girl up there. So I'm glad that you're giving her some uh, old school life. Like, uh, I'm surprised that my kids like that too. They're 20 and 18 uh, almost. And they like, uh, like, I have a picture, brought me to tears, bro. It's uh, something that he drew, my oldest drew in preschool. It says, I love my daddy because, and it's a blank line. You ever see the, you know, where they yeah, yeah. the kid. So it was love. I love my daddy, and the teacher wrote in because he takes me camping, and love it's a it, picture. Man. And my That's my son, awesome. my son drew like the tent and the fire and all that stuff. And now I have a picture of my phone of him taking his girlfriend and my dog camping. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah, I wanted to do. You know, I'm bad with technology, but you know that like then and now stuff yeah, going on Twitter. Yeah. yeah, I gotta make one of those and just show that off as a dad because that brought uh, that that brought some emotion, bro. I did the whole thing, man. I moved. I used to live in Ottawa. I now live about 40 minutes out in a small town. I grew up in a town of a thousand, so I'm small town born and bred. Um, and I just didn't like the city living, so I moved out here. I uh, started doing the camping, just trying to, I, I just, I love my, my upbringing. Right. So you just kind of want to recreate that and city life's just not for me. So I, I had to get out of the city, but I'm starting to kind of see it. Like she's less and less in front of the TV and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's good to see. I mean, that's what any parent wants. Right. Yeah. So Cole, yeah, we probably should take the rest of this conversation all offline because <laughs> we, we're going to have a show. I like to keep them, by the way, Cole, like when we hit 50 minutes, I didn't say this before. It's kind of a wrap it up time. So, um, but we have some important business to get to. My buddy commented down below, I believe his name is Bruce Almighty from the movie. And he was like, look, I'm tired of hearing about all these first round guys, second round guys. We've exhausted it to death. So I'm relying on my O-line expert, Cole here to take a deeper dive in the draft. But there's one guy I have to ask you about first, Cole, and that's Rasheed Walker, the tackle out of my Penn guy. State. Okay, great, great. My guy, because he's also my guy. You guys can see on the board as I bring it up on the screen, he's number 60 on my overall list, Cole. Not counting quarterbacks, but he's a guy that I have a, a solid second round grade yeah. on that I, I want I want this guy. On the team, I think he would fit perfectly. Long-term piece. So Give it to the people out there. Why do you like them as much as I do? And if you want to go deep dive on this, I've already run my mouth a lot. So I'm going to rely on you for information on this one, buddy. So there's about six or so. So if, if anyone hasn't read James guide, and so I did, Rashid Walker was one of my write-ups. And so you'll see if there's a red star beside a guy's name, it means he's one of James red stars, which means it's like a five-star fit for Baltimore. There's six or seven in the guide. One of them is Rashid Walker, and he was my only five-star of the guys I wrote up. Uh, but he's a five-star fit for me. And so that doesn't mean elite, uh, you know, first rounder. It just means fit, right? So right. Um, 
when I look at Walker's game, and I, there's no better game to go see what he can bring an NFL team than the Michigan game where he matches up with David Ojabo. And so what he did in that game was – a perfect example of what I call the, the game within the game. It's the pass rush battle, um, you know, because it's it's one of those things where it becomes it becomes a chess match. You're using pass rush moves to set up other pass rush moves. You're using certain sets. You're using certain uh, uh, you know uh, launch points for the for the defensive end. They're they're trying to set you up to get you to get into a tendency, and then they're going to counter off that. And the way Rasheed Walker dominated that pass rush battle with David Ojabo was masterful. One of the best I had seen in this class so far. Um, elite getting out of his stance, getting to his set point, had a really nuanced set point within his vertical set, which is something you don't commonly see in college football. You see a lot of 45s, you see a lot of quicks. Um, I like seeing how often Walker would vert set. And he, he there there are and this is what I didn't get into enough in the draft guide. If you guys go read it, he, he's very inconsistent in his technique. Um, that's that's the big reason he's not being talked about more. Um, there's also some maturity issues on and off the field. I don't know if you guys saw the video that went viral of him. I think he ends up on top of a Maryland player and he hits him with the old two two pump pump. Uh, so that yeah, I mean. I love it. I love that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I like to get down, you know, when it was a muddy game, you get a handful of dirt on the first couple snaps. And once you cop, pop out and get your hands up, you throw it in their face. And I love that kind of ratty stuff. That's just Cole Jackson kind of football. But yeah, um, so I was cool with it. I was cool with it. But teams will look at that. The one there was also, I think he had a couple of misdemeanors. Uh, one of them where he stole a bike on campus because he didn't want to walk to class. So, I mean, there's some maturity issues. I don't know. Th- I don't usually talk too much on this kind of stuff. I don't know him. I don't. I know nothing about him. Uh, That's right. It's, it's not one of those things where it's like he, he has all field concerns. I, I don't really believe in that because, I mean, I don't know. I don't know his story. Um, I know what's out there publicly. But it is something that is it needs to be considered uh, within its context of, you know, it may push teams off of him. But Back to the football, which is the more important part. Um, he's very nuanced in a set point. He has very, very good power. He's a gap run blocker. He did a little bit more zone at Penn State, but he projects really well. Um, he's really good at getting in space, getting guys in his shoot, which when I say get in his shoot, I mean square him up um, and kind of get him into a drive block situation. And he showed really good, really good power in that drive block situation. He's got the right size. I think he's 6'6", 325, which is exactly what the Ravens will look like. He had a little shorter arms, but you guys know I don't really care about the arm length thing. I think he used um, I think he used his hands. He created leverage really well. He had good bend in his hips, so I, I'm not worried about his pad level. Uh, I would like to see him use more independent hands. He got a little bit too... Uh, too Two-hand punchy. Two-hand punchy. And so two-hand punches are fine sometimes but it's really easy in that game within the game to manipulate it to that if you go watch like uh who's really good at it this year uh king kingsley on gambare his double hand swipe on two hand strikes is nasty and so that's something that i like to see rasheed walker work a little bit better in independent hand usage um but things that i can work with so what i love about him Quick out of his quick out of his stance for a bigger dude. Love seeing that. He has good fluidity. He squares guys up, and he has a really good ability to navigate his set point. I think he had issues of oversetting and creating interior pass rush lanes. I think that's probably from the athletic limitations. He's not the most athletic guy in the world, but he brings that quickness and the pop in his hands. So he's he's got everything I want. So, Cole, you're echoing a, a lot of my thoughts. Great information. The only two things I wanted to add to it is, yes, when you know, it's easier to dunk a basketball with one hand because of two uh, instead of two because why? Because you can reach. You can have longer reach when you, you, you kind of negate your length if you're just two-hand punching. You want to work independently just like your hands and feet are in coordination. You want your arms to be in coordination too. Uh, he just looks natural to me, Cole. Yeah. And uh, when the, the, the matchup with Ajabu, perfect example, something I would have brought up too. But um, it's like he's natural, but he still has upside to grow with his the technique and all the stuff that you were talking about. But it comes easy. You're talking about a guy who has work to do on his hand placement and his punch and all that. But his feet are so natural that he can get by even against a rusher that would have went probably in the top half of the first round this year in Ajabu. So – that just goes to show you the upside. And I think that, you know, in my opinion, if Ronnie's not ready, Rashid could could Walker into the building 
and start day one and be okay and be okay. It's a very pro ready. ready. You're right. A three year starter in a in a Big Ten conference. So I mean, pro ready is a great way of putting it. Yes, and that's the kind of guy we need. And at the same time, he will be able to learn from Joe D and our coaching here and get some straight. The off the field stuff, I'm with you, Cole. It, it, we're not in the interviews just like we're not in the medicals. So like a guy like Tevin Jenkins last year that I was really hoping we took instead of taking the Dothy away, I had no idea. We had no idea that yeah. he had all those issues with his back. And so there will be guys on the board that every year, Cole, I'm screaming like, why is that guy still available? Take that guy, take that guy. And then it turns out after the draft, you find out there's a reason that they drop. So if Rasheed Walker's still hanging in the fourth, fifth round, that's a red flag. That'll probably tell you that there's some serious stuff going on. Maybe Penn State was covering up a bunch of incidences on, on campus, and it's worse than we thought. But it just seemed like, oh, man, I, I hate to say this, but like boys being boys, just some like immaturity issues and not like that, bad And that's how I tried guy. to frame it because like it, it seems like – and it's both on and off the field because there's a couple, a couple personal foul penalties, which that just speaks to maturity to me, not – this guy's a bad dude. I'd never right. say that. Um, right. I, I see some maturity issues. And I think uh, I, I always lean on, you, you get these nuggets from Dane Brugler and the Beast, and he, he specifically used the word maturity, and then he put brackets on and off the field. So I, I respect him for doing that and making sure that, I appreciate analysts out there that kind of keep it in the boundaries of kind of what they know about a guy, and they don't try and tarnish a man's character if they don't know. So that's I, right. I, I respect the hell out of that. So, and I respect the ones Cole too, who also aren't quick with the trigger uh -huh. for that tag. Yeah. So like somebody like Dane and uh, Lance Erline is really professional about that too, where if you see it on his report, there's probably something to it. So, you know, again, we're not in the meeting rooms. We don't know the whole history. We don't know their medicals, but you know, we're just going by the tape. Cole and I think similarly on that. I'm not flagging anybody or bumping them down for stuff that I have no uh, idea about. So, Cole, uh, I'll just leave the floor open to you. Who's the next lineman that we're talking about? Uh, oh, one more thing. And, and Rasheed Walker in the third. Before you go into your next lineman, does that seem like a good target to you? That's I, where I think I'm I pick at. him in every mock draft at 76 after going corner and edge. So yes, like if if you get him at 76, slam dunk Vince Carter arm hang. Like I'm I'm for it. <laughs> so who we got, buddy? Who you want to talk about? So let's keep it with the tackles because I think we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about two tackles, one tackle guard, and then two centers. So let's let's go to Dare Rosenthal out of Kentucky. Really interesting guy. Um, had a really odd career, I'll call it, at LSU. Um, he, he just transferred to Kentucky for his senior year. He was part of that 2019 team uh, that won the Natty, but uh, you know, he, uh, Sadiq Shadik. Uh, Charles was our starter at left tackle. Um, Rosenthal did get in some games. I think it was during blowouts when he came in. Um, his The thing that I've had a hard time figuring out is his size. He's 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, borderline, but he's listed at 317 as a freshman. He's been down as low as 290. He got back up to 306 at his pro day. Um, yeah. I don't I don't know what he's doing. Um, I haven't really been able to figure it out. Um, and Cole, I'm gonna in, I'm gonna interject yeah. here. Like he doesn't look like he's that big. I think that they're playing games because he's really, in my opinion, if I had to guess, that he's six 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 seven two ninety, which is skinny as a beanpole, and they're trying to make him turn him into. Well, you you see pedal. that skinniness in his game. He's not girthy. Um, he doesn't have a girthy body type, but he has a body type where you could see weight being added. So it's really easy when you have that type of frame to go up and down like that. It's like you kind of, and, and it kind of, it's just been really weird to kind of figure out. But the reason I looked at him really closely is when I'm looking at left, when I'm looking at right tackles to go in the Raven scheme, um, I need a powerful run blocker. When I'm dealing That's with right. left tackles, my priority is their pass protection. It's always going to be their pass protection. We saw a really unique usage in 2019 where the Ravens ran abnormally significant gaps concepts to their right and abnormally high zone concepts to their left. Why would you do that? Cause I'm going to run gap behind Orlando Brown jr. And I'm going to run zone behind Ronnie Stanley. Um, it was right. really good. Um, and, and I guess, you know, that's one of those things where you could be like, well, that's kind of a tendency. I mean, maybe, but no one could stop them anyway. So um, I guess it didn't really matter. And that's the beauty of a multiple run scheme is, 
um, you know, you can you can put both concepts in. So with Dan Rosenthal, I'm really the reason I like him more than others is it, when I'm looking at a guy that's going to be like, well, let's call him a one. 20 plus draft pick, like a fourth, fifth round pick. I want to see at least one thing that is a prerequisite for that position to be a good NFL player that he does well. And so with Dare Rosenthal, it's his movement and pass protection. Um, he's got that kind of, I always call it, he moves like a basketball player playing defense. Um, he's just got a natural kick slide. Um, I saw him do quite a few vertical sets. Um, thought, thought he moved naturally. He had really, really good hip bend. So again, the way I could see that kind of translating into the NFL is really developing that pass protection ability at the left tackle spot. He's not a powerful run blocker. Um, I think he's got powerful hands, really powerful grip strength, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I just think he, he gets too narrow in his drive block. I think he, uh, I, I think he doesn't have the power profile to him to be that kind of true, uh, you know, drive blocker, but in terms of if I'm the Ravens looking for a developmental left tackle, you could look at a guy like Darryl Rosenthal and be like, I'm going to stick him behind Ronnie Stanley. Pray to God he's healthy. And, you know, I could see him develop. So, again, I'm looking for one thing that he does really well that I need to see from an NFL tackle, and I see good movement skills and pass protection. So I think he's got some things to clean up. He's not very long. I didn't like some of his hand usage. Um, he doesn't have a really strong inside hand. Uh, again, that kind of speaks to hand power. Uh, but he had strong grip. So, I mean, it's one of those interesting things that when you get into the traits, you kind of see things that don't align. But uh, overall, really like the player. Um, again, we're talking about like maybe a, one of their comp picks in the fourth round. I could see maybe being a good fit. Um, but that's that's what I think Darryl Rosenthal brings to the table. Excellent. So I'm going to have to go back and watch him now, along with a couple of other guys that you're going to bring up here. Because, uh, well, first of all, echo your thoughts. I don't worry about scheme at all when it comes to left tackle. Uh, I was just talking about this. I really, do, you know, your number one job, your number two job, your number three job is to be good in pass protection and protect your quarterback. If, you know, I don't worry about if they're better in gap scheme, zone scheme, all that other stuff. Can you protect the quarterback's blind side, give him the confidence to be able to make a throw or can't you? And Rosenthal has this, has that. The reason I have him, he made my board, Cole. He's at 162, so he's down at the bottom. Uh, he may, maybe a little lower. Maybe you would probably have him higher than some of the other tackles I have ahead of him. But um, the, the only thing that worries me is that guys like Miles Garrett or, or TJ Watt are going to be able to go right through him, and there's yeah. not going to be anything that he can do about it. So if you're looking at four years of control of a guy, I think it might take him a year, year and a half to be able to get that base and that leg strength and – and everything but yeah basketball player natural athlete i noticed too cole because you want to keep a nice base but uh he has that natural lean forward when he wants to that kind of makes him longer than than he is like he's got a natural feel for when he can cheat a little bit get a little front heavy and get hands on you and just control it and uh but yes the inside arm being weak that is I'm more concerned about the outside arm to be, to be honest with you. Do you find that the outside arm is more important for strength? Like, like a Leatherwood last year, I couldn't get over how weak his outside arm was in pass pro and it dropped him down my board. Um, do you feel like the outside arm is more important the inside arm or as an O-line guy, are you going to tell me they're equally important? It really depends on, well, it depends on your movement skills. If you can really kick slide to match a guy's, uh, to, to match a guy trying to bend your arc, then I think you can live with it. You never really want to have a weak hand, um, but it's guys like like a Rashid Walker, for example, um, he'll take deeper vertical sets because you call that inside hand the stop sign, right? So when, when a guy yeah. tries to inside counter on you, and Icky Kwani does this extremely well, um, when they try and develop that inside counter, you just put up stop sign, right? Just get that on camera. Uh, yeah. So, so that's that's the big thing that I see. Um, so, I mean, you don't really want to have a weak hand anywhere. I would say they're both equally important, um, but it's going to depend on your movement skills because if you are, let's use our Lander Brown Jr. for example, because he's he's a great example for this. And I'll say Daniel Falale too because I think they're very similar. Um, those guys aren't going to carry you with their kick slide all the way to the arc right they're they're gonna right. have to rely on that outside hand power and a little bit of a lean and then they're gonna kind of pick that up uh so those guys need outside and so alex leatherwood is a perfect example for this because he didn't have the adequate kick slide in order to so when you have 
poor kick slide and a poor outside hand, bad right. combination. Um, so I think you're, you're nailing a very important thing. And it really comes down to, and this is why I always talk about it, it's all about how do they use their hands in relation to the other aspects of their game. So it's, it's just all about trying to marry those two together. Um, so again, you never want to have a deficiency because in that game within the game, they're going to attack it. Um, but if I have a guy that can move really well and, and won't have to rely too much on using that hand to kind of stop outward movement, I can live with it. So Cole, the importance of having a third tackle this year, I'm going to kind of go off script a little bit. I'm, I'm nervous. Like the, the part of the reason, like you were talking about, you draft Rasheed Walker in every mock draft you have, one of the reasons I have him so high up the board is that when I come to pick 14 or any pick around that area, really, if you trade back or trade up, it's a defensive guy. And then when you look at who's left over in round two, it's either a wide receiver sticks out or, it, again, another defensive guy. Like, I'm not that high on Fa'alele. I'm not that high on uh, who else is in that range. Cole, help me out. I'm drawing a blank here. Raymond. Uh, uh, Ray, Bernard got... Ryman, right. Yeah. Those, those guys. Uh, so I'm not ju uh, jumping to get those guys. And Rasheed Walker always seems to stand out to me as like a, a get this guy. So, um, but speak about the importance of a third tackle in this team and a backup to Ronnie, because I was talking to uh, Alex and Sutton on their purple rain podcast. The one thing I believe that can derail our season the fastest is bad left tackle play quarterback aside, of course, but like something happens on defense and we have injuries or a weakness. We can scheme around that. You can't scheme around a, a bad left, or, you know, poor play at left tackle. Yeah, no. And I mean, we kind of saw that last year. Um, and, and I mean, Villanueva was weird because I actually don't think like he had a higher win rate than I think people realize it was when he lost, it was just so bad and it was always resulting in a very negative outcome. It wasn't kind of yes. like the slow burning loss and those slow burning losses are funny because those are the Morgan Moses losses. And that's why I love Morgan Moses so much when he loses a pass rush rep, it's kind of a slow burn that results in like a hurry and not so much a QB hit a sack. Um, but he's just, and so that when we look at the tackle situation, it's like, I'm good at right tackle now. Like I got, if, if, if James came in and the best case scenario is James was like in great shape and he's recovered and you know, hallelujah, he's back. You have an incredible battle at right tackle and whoever wins that, you just have a good right tackle. Um, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, if, if James can't get right, which is, extremely possible morgan Moses, your right tackle you're happy um so right tackle check mark it's all about the left tackle spot for me so you know third fourth i keep referring to it as fourth tackle spot because i could see them carrying four tackles this year um i think where i differ in my opinion to the others is i think patrick mccary is an offensive tackle in the nfl right so my priority would be getting a center and then patrick mccary is now your your six man across all five spots but if Ronnie Stanley isn't right week one. Patrick McCarr is your day one left tackle. No one's been able to point me to a game except for the second Steelers game last year where he played on a hobbled foot where he was a liability at offensive tackle. Um, so until someone points me in that direction, I'm going to keep saying that because that's what the evidence shows me. No, I got you. And, you know, I think that McCarry is just so valuable because we don't need to take two chances, uh, carry four tackles. Like that's where I would disagree. I would be like, Look, McCarry is your backup right tackle. You know, find yourself a center. Like you're saying, you got Tristan Cologne. So having McCarry on this team may allow us to focus in on one guy in particular that we think that we can count on and not just like gather tackles who may, may make it. So I appreciate that. Now, a guy that I want more information on because he confused me is a guy from Ohio State, Thayer Mumford who we saw in and out of the lineup, moving around. Is he a guard? Is he a tackle? I have him at number 107 on my list, Cole, because there's just true talent there. You, you don't go to Ohio State and perform well without having true talent. He does have that. There's some up and downness to his game, but uh, I can't look past like what I consider the upside for this guy. But I want to know what you think his best position will be. What have you gathered happened at Ohio State? And let's dig into a player that I have as, you know, third round or day three value. If we get him on day three, I think that's a great value. I think he's a tackle. Um, and so, I mean, he's got, he's a little bit shorter. He's stumpier, um, but he's got the requisite length. I mean, he's got like 
third, and it's not just the length measurement, it's the way he uses his hands uh, really pops to me. Um, so what happened was he was their left tackle, and then last year they kicked Petit for, or moved Petit Frere from right tackle to left tackle and then moved Mumford inside. And the ironic part to this entire situation is I think Petit Frere is a guard. Um, I think he's a guard in his own scheme which is weird because they moved him to left tackle and they moved Thayer Munford inside. And I think he's a tackle. Um, so I, I think he really struggled on the inside this year. I watched two games this year at guard. And then I think one 2020 and one 2019, if I have that right, maybe not 20, I have to double check, but it was two games at tackle, two games at guard. Um, I really wanted to kind of expose myself to kind of multiple games at the two spots. Um, you know, really interesting guy. Cause I think he's, when he plays tackle, he was really efficient in his steps um, to kind of play that uh, play that set point game. He was, you know, quick out of his stance. He doesn't have good long speed. I think he ran like a five three eight forty or something absurd. Like he's really doesn't have that kind of. He's not. He's not a track athlete by any means. He's not an overly athletic guy, but very efficient in his kick stance. Um, I thought I saw, I saw quite a few vertical sets, which I liked. Um, Ohio State's a little weird too because you know they run a lot of play action off that zone scheme. Um, they they use some RPO usage too, so it's kind of tough to see those true pass sets that you want to see. But I really liked his use of length. I liked his hand power. Um, he's just one of those guys where I feel like if he gets his hands on you, it's kind of over. Um, but what's going to happen when he's got a kick slide out to a Miles Garrett, when he's got a kick slide out to a – that that's kind of where you struggle with him as a player. But inside a guard um, – and this is the ironic part is people are like, oh, he's not athletic, just kick him inside. Well, he really struggled with the quickness on the inside, and that's what concerns me there. Right. I, I felt like oh, as a tackle he had more room room not necessarily time but he had more room to really get guys in his lane and then deploy his length and that's what his game was it was kind of bait and hook um where i'm gonna you know i have this lane way i'm gonna vertical set you're not gonna be able to bend me i got just enough juice to kind of get into that far in my set point to use the power in my hands like you said he's one of those guys where he needs a strong outside hand um so he was able to kind of get there and use his hand usage use his length really efficient use of his length. I was surprised. I expected a guy that kind of like has, I don't know how to explain it. He's like shorter, but his arms are really long. Um, I, I expected a little bit more hip hinge in his game. Uh, just cause like, as you start to lean, it, you can naturally hit and he, he's got a little bit of it, but not nearly what I was expecting, uh, when I saw his arm length measurements, uh, vis-a-vis -vis his height. So overall, I just, I really liked his movement. Um, I think he's a tackle though. I really don't think he's a guard on the next level. I think he's going to struggle with the quickness on the inside. Yes. Yeah, so the opposite of what we see from Iki Aquanu, where, you know, he could play guard or tackle at either one. And people think, well, guard's easier. But, I mean, DaCosta even mentioned this a couple of years ago, Cole, that when you're looking at these guys who may not be able to stick at tackle, things happen a lot faster on the inside. And in, in – Look that, at DJ in tackles, Fluker. Right. Look at Fluker. Fluker. He, Fluker. He's not athletic. Kick him inside. Well, he's not quick enough to do it there. At least at tackle, he's got a little bit of a lane way. Um, so I actually, and think he can use his length to his advantage for Fluker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Mumford is a guy that, you know, I've struggled with, but I put him at the very end of my day three value at one Oh seven, because there's just a lot of tools to work with and there's good tape against good competition yeah. out there, but the whole petite Ferrer thing with him and then <laughs> Ohio state itself kind of makes any kind of offensive evaluation tricky. Aside from the wide receivers, they get the you know they they get the cream of the crop there. But we've seen with the quarterbacks being hit or miss and the the slow development curve, the offense is so creative and so good that in some ways I think they do their players a disservice by not getting him. They 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 put them in just so so much advantageous situations with the best athletes in the world. So, so kind of tough with these Ohio State linemen, like you say, you're not seeing a lot of what they would see in the NFL. But yeah, Thayer Mumford. You think he's a tackle, even though the measurables might say he's a guard, and you think things will move too fast from him on the inside. So is 107, like having him ahead of a guy like Rosenthal, like would you rather take like a Rosenthal or Mumford? Do you put him in the same category, or do you think Mumford's more polished? Uh, like compare him to like fourth round. Is this a fourth round guy for you as well? I definitely see him as a late fourth round guy, uh, maybe early fifth. It's really going to come down. The, the, the upside about Mumford, so to, let, let's be really clear about this. 
I gave him a larger Ravens fit adjustment than I would have given like a Rosenthal. And that's because of the power profile in his game and his run blocking. Um, so, you know, again, for a left tackle or I would, yeah, for a left tackle, which I think he can play um, in an emergency situation, he's probably going to project better as a right tackle. Um, again, one of those guys you can kind of run behind. Um, I, I I like the, the scheme fit. I mean, he's going to be in a gap based offense where he's going to really down block and blow guys off the line. And that's his game. Like that's what he did so well. Right. He's asked to do it even, even in zone block situations. And if he was play side uh, tackle, he did, his ability to kind of, you know, use that length on reach blocks um, was really impressive because he was able to kind of use his grip strength and get guys in a shoot and then drive the crap out of them versus a petite frere who's a, who's a pusher, not a, not a, not a drive blocker. Um, so that's really the difference there. So, I mean, for a Ravens based fit, I could see Munford being a better fit for Rosenthal. It really comes back to, can Munford be that left tackle pass protector that a guy like Rosenthal, and this is where you get into so many nuanced discussion right. points within your rankings. And it's like, makes you pull your hair out and make your hair turn gray. Um, Cause there's so many ways to slice and dice it. Um, so I can see like as a right tackle in the Ravens scheme, I think he'd be a great fit, but then it's like, well, what, do we really need a right tackle? Cause we already got yes. two. And that's kind of the interest, but I, I like Munford as a player. I'm definitely higher on him than, than most other people. Um, and you're, you're nailing it. You, you can't teach that length. You can't teach that physical ability. Uh, you can't teach uh, that hand strength. Well, I guess quote, you can teach hand strength, but he just has that drive block. He's natural. Yeah. He's it. natural yeah. at it. And, you know, his positioning, some of the subtle things he does with his his feet, you know, like that you may worry about in, you know, inside or maybe in vertical sets. He's kind of natural when he has hands on you to be able to position his body just so subtly and create a running lane and not just create a running lane, but create a clear running lane that as a running back, when things are happening so fast, you want that security. You see Mumford start to move and start to turn his guy and you just know you don't have to look twice. You don't even have to have it in your peripheral. It's done. You're running through it. There's If it's an arm stuck out, you're going to run through it. You don't have to change your path at all. Um, but, yes, I, you know, I'm actually – I think I'm higher than Petit Ferrer than you are because of the, the fit. Like, I see him as a left tackle. We saw him struggle at right tackle. I think he's got the feet for a left tackle. I think, like, you you're were talking about the quick wins and, and slow wins and slow losses – I see Petit Ferrer as a slow loss guy. Like his yeah. feet are good enough to where, to where he he's going to be able to protect your quarterback. And of course, Lamar Jackson, probably the best I've ever seen at just hanging in with that backside pressure and not really fearing it. And uh, I mean, Flacco was great too, but Lamar of course is a different kind of quarterback mm -hmm. than Joe. But uh, yeah, if you just give Lamar some security on his blind side, he's going to stick in there and make things happen. So I, I do like Petit Ferrer. Um, Zach Tom, interesting guy out of Wake Forest, really got my attention at the Combine um, just because of his sheer athleticism. I mean, I'm watching casually, and I don't – not casually. I'm just soaking up information. I'm just missing football. Don't really care about 40 times. I, I like the field drills. I do like the field drills. Um, I would like to see more one-on-ones at the Combine like they do at the Senior Bowl just to kind of mix this guys up. But I guess they got so many people in the building, that's not practical. But he caught my attention at the Combine, Cole, because he moves like a tight end. And then when you look at his profile, he's got playing time along the line. He could be a center. He could be a tackle. He could be a guard. I kind of like him like as a fallback plan if we miss out on one of these mid-round centers to where it makes a guy like Zach Tom a priority. So go ahead and take it. Where do you see him fitting best at the NFL would be my main question to you. I think he's a center. Um, I think he can, can play tackle. Um, but what I see from him, and he reminds me a lot of Patrick McCary in the sense that as a left – I mean, I, I don't think it gets enough attention. He absolutely shut the door on Jermaine Johnson in that FSU game. Like it was, I was actually, I caught Zach Tom in film watching while I was watching Jermaine Johnson. And I was like, this guy can't, and they have a redshirt freshman. Yeah. Redshirt freshman. Can't think of his name off the top of my head. Hell of a player too. And Jermaine Johnson struggled against both. Um, but what reminds me of McCary is Zach Tom is an absolute battler. Um, like he's just, He's your typical, he's undersized, he's got short arms, blah, 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 and he doesn't care. He just goes out, he battles every rep, and he finds ways to beat you. 
Um, he has a phenomenal set point. He's consistently squared up. He doesn't give outside rush lanes. He doesn't give inside rush lanes. He's squared up on you every – he's a natural mover. Um, th those athletic traits aren't just, uh, you know, underwear Olympic stuff. It's stuff he does on tape. Um, you know, he, he's definitely got a lack of length. And I thought Jermaine Johnson would have taken better advantage of that, but he's got a really strong anchor. And I think that's what kind of gives me a better transition to the uh, center position than McCary did. McCary right. really struggled with power on the inside, more at guard than center, um, where he was kind of asked to kind of lead block or kind of, you know, anchor down on some of these big, big dudes. Um, but I, I think Zach Tom would make a really natural transition to center. Um, I think he's scheme versatile in that situation. I see enough in his power profile uh, to see him being able to do some gap stuff. He's probably going to be a better fit for his own because, you, you know, it's – got a guy that athletic you want to get him out in space um so i see that as a really good fit but he has the power profile to fit um and then he brings you the added value of if you get into a pinch like the ravens did last year you have multiple guys in different spots on your line um whether he's a backup or a starter they can they can play different positions and that's the value that mccary brings and that's the value i can see zach tom bringing and i see in his game cole too when you're talking about how it's, it shows in his tape I don't think all of that is credited to his athleticism. I think it has to do with his football mind too. And it, I mean, you can take that from your context clues too. This is a guy that's comfortable anywhere and just kind of a natural pass blocker, his coordination. Cole, he strikes me as the type of guy that you could put him at right tackle and it wouldn't mess up his feet and everything. He would just kind of naturally get it. Yeah. Or you could put him at left tackle, anywhere on the line. But it's not just that he is quick. I think that his mind moves quick. And that allows him to over, overcome any kind of like physical limitations he would have at whatever position he's playing. Um, but yeah, McCary is a good, is a good uh, example here. And a guy who is just not only a battler, but somebody who's got that versatility, natural football player. And, you know, I would like to see him get a position down as far as concentrate on this Zach Tom, you know, okay. If we're going to stick you at center, let's work on them. Like that, that leg press machine, get some glutes in there, get some, get some, uh, you know, some thighs, some glutes, some quads, some calf strength, all that stuff that you need to battle the biggest people in the sport on the inside. And then, uh, you know, I think that that's a fair projection for him. I think he can be an above average slash dominant center because of his brain and his, like his timing on some of the combo blocks and has a lot to do with comp timing and feet. Like I could really see him working well in tandem with whoever's next to him and just being a solid piece for us. And, you know, I'm looking at him. I have him 122 overall, so I have him right in the Thayer Mumford, uh, you know, uh, depending on what we need, right in that range. But uh, Zach Tom, again, would be my backup plan if we miss out. I'm kind of big on getting one of those mid-round centers somewhere between Dylan Parham and Luke Fortner. Like, yeah. with all that group of guys, Cam Jurgens included and Cole Strange and all those guys, if we miss out on one of them, I'm making Zach Tom a priority and hopefully these zone teams don't scoop him up though, Cole, because he does scream like he's got special talent to be able to block on the move. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think he's got just enough power profile to make me comfortable that he'll be just fine in those, those, those down block situations. Yeah. So Cole, you got me. Now we talked about this before the program because Cole was kind enough to send me a list of names. And since we're doing deep dives, I wanted to have information available, even though this is Cole's show, I'm soaking up the knowledge here. And Cole's like, yeah, and I want to talk about Ben Brown. And I'm like, wait a minute, Cole. I had 234 players over here, 234, no quarterbacks. And Ben Brown did not come across my radar. And it's making me like insecure now because I'm like, oh man, every year you talk about Brandon Stevens. All I could say on Ken's show last year was, yeah, I remember he had red shoes on. And I remember that, uh, <laughs> he, he moved from corner to safety, but like I, I didn't remember anything else about him. I was like, man, like I couldn't even say anything because I would have been talking out my, you know, you know what at that point. So Ben Brown, now he played at Ole Miss. So this ain't no sucker conference, man. He's in the SEC hanging and banging as a center. I haven't watched him. Was he playing center? Was he playing guard? Tell me about this guy. I saw his profile. It looks like a kind of a big dude. Yeah, so he's like, I mean, I couldn't find a more suitable Bradley Bozeman replacement. Uh, okay. 6'5", 315, um, which I think was the exact measurables of Bozeman when he came out. 
uh, power profile up the yin yang. He's not the best mover in space. Uh, that's definitely going to be his weakness. He doesn't have great lateral agility in the run game, uh, but I don't think he'd be asked to do it a lot here. And that's kind of, I mean, Jason, you remember the way I pounded the table to move Bozeman to center. It was exactly yep. that reason. But uh, to, to answer your question, he played right guard last year, center the year before, and then guard previously. I think he logged thir 31 starts. Uh, I might be wrong on that. Maybe it's 28. I think it's 28 starts uh, over the years at Ole Miss. Um but uh, he projects as a center, and it's going to be the same thing as I saw with Bozeman. He's a gap scheme center through and through. Um, he's just he, – he's he's big, long, girthy. Um, he's got great length for the center position, um, and he's just a power profile. Like, I, I, I don't know how else to put it. Like, he was straight up drive blocking dudes um, in the SEC – good competition, big, powerful dudes, and he was moving bodies in the run game. Uh, and so he's going to have to have a little bit of development in the, uh, in the, in the past game. Like he's got, uh, you know, we talked about it. It's quick on the inside. I think he really struggled with his hand placement. His hands got high, a lot of, a lot of shoulder rubbing where he's kind of going off, right, falling off, right. Falling off and giving up his chest. Um, so some things that you're going to have to work with there. I didn't love his, his lateral quickness with his feet, um, but he screams Raven to me. It's stuff that I feel pretty confident that with the right coach and get him in there with coach D uh, coach Joe D sorry. And I think they could really put something together there, but he just screams Raven to me. He's like that classic mid round center that they seem to always get and develop. And he may not be ready year one, year two, uh, but I could see, you know, year three, there's your starting center, um, which is, I mean, I basically just described Bradley Bozeman's career. Um, right. So that's kind of how we do it. That's kind of how we've done it for a long time, long sample size now, you know, with Jensen and Skura and Bozeman just kind of working your way and earning that second contract and, and all that other stuff, man. But, um, but so cool with, with his weakness, with his strength being power, obviously that says his weakness for a guy that's, you know, I haven't don't know much about would be quickness. What's his recovery skills? Like this, does he have that Ben Powers ability to once he's beat to kind of be pliable, flexible, and just hang in there? Or is he really going to have to like tear down his feet and be more careful uh, to guard against quickness? So I think the reason I put my money on him is, and I mean, this is a little bit of an intangible, but he's got that competitive toughness, um, Badler. And I, I know that sounds cliche and people go on and on about high motors and all that stuff, but you can't underrate it. Like it's just, it's, those are the guys I want to bet on those guys that are never going to give up. Um, as much as I was hard on Ben Bowers, he did have that going for him. I mean, you'd have oh, yeah. times at left guard where his right foot would drop below uh, the flat line and he would still battle through the rep. And that's really kind of, you know, he didn't have the core strength. He didn't have the upper body strength, uh, but he was able to battle. And so I think I see that type of competitive toughness. Um, he, he's a, he's a very physical dude. It's just what I see where he runs into issues is with his hand placement. Um, so like if he slides off, you know, let's say he throws out his left pad to a, a left side one tech and it slides off that inside shoulder. So now he's getting driven in through, he's just got that mean, nasty streak where he's going to kind of find a way to try and re-engage, get low. He doesn't bend super well. So I don't want to give off that theory that, um, you know, he's going to be a super bendy player. He's got natural high leverage because he's six foot five on the interior. Um, so that's always going to work against you. But I actually thought he bent pretty well given his height. Um, so, but I just see a guy that's competitive, that's got that hand strength, he's got that grip strength, um, you know, and he's going to battle through the rep. So I think if he can, the biggest path for him to have success as a pass protector in the NFL is really developing that very clean hand striking ability. And I think he's got quick, fast hands, but I almost think it works to a detriment to him because they're so quick that they kind of fly off guys' shoulders if he misses that mark. So it's all about okay. that initial strike. Um, but you kind of see guys that are a little hesitant, a little, you know, they're just trying to kind of make sure they hit the right spot where this guy is physically aggressive. He wants to kind of get up in your kitchen and get his, get your hand, which makes sense. I mean, he's a guy with athletic limitations. He plays center 
quarters are closed right off the bat. So let's get right in these guys' kitchens. Let's get right in their grill. Um, one of those guys that wants to smoke, right? So I would say competitive nice. toughness, um, those types of things that kind of excite me for a player. And again, that those are the guys I'm putting my man, money on to bet on. That's why you see it every year, man. I bet on Patrick McCary because he just keeps proving us wrong. You know, he can't do yep. this because of that. He can't do that because of this. And he just continues to do it. So um, it's an intangible. It's a little cliche. I'll give you all that. But it, that's where I put my money with these guys. So so you feel the intangible with him. That's important to me, though. You have to be able to be a battler in this league because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a microcosm of life. No matter how much you know about the O-line, Cole, there's somebody out there who knows more, has a better perspective. Same sure. thing in football. <laughs> Same thing in football. No matter how strong you are, there's going to be somebody stronger. No matter how quick you are, there's somebody quicker. I mean, so with with Brown, I like the fact that, you you know, the intangible when he's going up against somebody who's even as big as he is but quicker, that he's got that battler mentality. But, yeah, with, with his hands, maybe he just needs to take his time a little bit more. Like, just say, okay, let me be quick with my feet and more methodical with my hands. And just really, instead of throwing a jab, look at it more as like one of them – mid round uh not a haymaker but not a jab just a yeah. nice firm you know what i mean first contact uh i can't wait to dig in and 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 uh and try to get a feel for him because again off my radar so you know just when i think i'm done cole reeling me back in bro reeling me yeah. back into the film room and i love it man i'm i'm getting to the point cole where i'm gonna have to like stop you know what i mean and just reflect and be like you did all you could because it's it's getting that time at the draft, so 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 much fun, so much fun. So with with uh with Brown though, his first name's Ben Ben Brown. Ben Brown, yeah. And uh, just a context note on him: he got hurt after it, uh, it was October twenty third. He got hurt. He would have been a Senior Bowl guy had he okay. not got hurt. So I mean, that's important because that's why he's on no one's radar right now. So you you think he's like a, a year development guy, maybe a, I a think fan, so. phantom IR, maybe one of those guys we put on, you know, phantom IR and keep on the roster and that kind of thing if we were able to land him. And then you, you kind of you got to get a feel that he's going to be drafted because if he's a power scheme guy and, you know, teams are going to take him off their board, they run zone maybe. Is this a guy that we could bring in as a UDFA, as a priority UDFA? I don't think he'll make it to UDFA, but I don't think you have to take him overly early because I think you're nailing it. Um, there's so many teams running zone right now that um, it's kind of like, you know, the way I look at Linderbaum is not a fit. They're going to look at Ben Brown is not a fit. That's just the way it works, right? right? So um, even though there's so many schemes that are multiple, but you're always going to lean towards what your kind of, you know, your jab is. And then the, your multiple scheme is, is your cross, your hook, your, your uppercut, all that good stuff. So right. um, I could see... I pencil him in at like 141. I don't see why not. Like it's, will he get to the sixth round? The problem is you sit there with no pick for 53 wow. picks. So that that's where it kind of gets tough. And so I think the, you know, and I've, I've been pretty much pro trading up. I'm cool with that, leveraging those fours. But if they do maintain those fours, I like how you can kind of grab a couple of guys, 139, 141 back to back that, you know, it might seem reachy, reachy in terms of they didn't fit the mock draft, but you're just, you don't want to sit there for 53 picks and watch them all fly off the board. Right. So right. Um, it's kind of nice having two picks back to back. Uh, you could look at a couple of guys like that. I would have him in that. I have him in a tier with Luke Fortner. Like I think in terms of really? the, okay. Ravens, the Ravens scheme fit adjustment, he's good enough to be up there with Fortner. Um, in my opinion, I don't have him Like I have, uh, I would have a tier above. I have like, I think I'd go probably Parham, Jurgens, Strange, and then a lower tier, um, another couple of guys probably. But then I think I'm lower on Fortner than most, so maybe that's what's part of this. But I would have him there with Fortner, um, and I think he's a better fit. Um, Fortner's a little more polished as a player, but he doesn't have quite the power profile that you get with a uh, with Ben Brown. Yeah, and I have pretty much the same thing on my list. You know, Strange, Jurgens, Fortner, right there. I have Par Parham kind of uh, up there, second he's round. Good, grade. Eh? I, I he's like really Parham. good. Yeah, like man, Parham he Parham. he gives you a little bit of everything, Cole, that I like. So, you mentioned something I want to give my two cents on as we wrap up the show here. I love the idea of both trading up and trading back in this draft. So, what I've been looking at recently is maybe a trade back in the first round, but then a trade back up into the second round or trade back up into the third 
to really nail and get four guys that you see there in my orange section, you know, maybe even a per guy from the purple section falls. And instead of getting three starters, you get four. And then my philosophy is Cole from there. If the draft is deep and you see some other teams reaching, then you can recoup those picks later. If you really want those picks in a deep draft, you can trade one of our fourths back and pick up extra pick there, so on and so forth. So when you're talking about we don't have a pick in the range from the fourth to the sixth and you're sitting through 50 whatever picks, like I could see us picking players in that range. I'm not ruling out, and you never, you never should, but especially in this draft, I'm not ruling out any player on any part of the board because we could be picking there, Cole. So could you, yeah. could you wrap us up on like your overall draft strategy? How are you feeling about how the Ravens should use these picks or the possibilities, however you want to phrase it, buddy? I said it kind of, I, I think the way I said it the other day on Twitter is a nice little summary of it. I see about eight or nine guys that are worth a top 15 pick. And then I see about 10 guys worth, no, sorry, 20 guys worth like a 20 to 30 pick. Um, right. And so it's, it's that, I think, Picking in the if we had our picks last year, we'd be sitting pretty. Um, so I do love that idea. If you could somehow trade back uh, and pick up kind of a first and a second, and then you trade from seventy six back up, and you kind of have four picks in the top sixty four, um, you yeah. kind of got. I, I, that's my ideal sad strategy. Um, every time I do like mocks and screw around, that's kind of the best situation that I got. Some people have thrown out there the whole trading. Uh, uh, back with uh, like the the Lions, and I know you're going all the way back to 32 um, and picking up 34 as well. But you know 32, 44, or 32, 34, 45, and then you trade 76 to get back up uh, and throw in a couple of force or something. And I think you feel really good about the four players you walk away from, even though you waited so long in the first round. Um, I think you sit pretty doing that. So I am very much in line with that strategy i absolutely love the trade back pick up a second or a very early third and then trade back up from that 76 pick um or even you know trying to jump up if you if you keep that and maybe you pass on like a rasheed walker for a falling defensive player package 100 with something and get up there for rasheed walker in the in the yes. 80s so yeah i mean dude, dude you know with the picks that we have on your particular or the ravens particular board you can maneuver this to get four players in their like literally top 40 or 50. Yeah. Because other teams have different needs. So it's, it, it sounds far fetched to somebody who may not follow the draft, but seriously, the Ravens could take their top 40 or 50 guys maneuver around that board. And you, you're going to guarantee that one of those guys is still there with your fourth pick. If you play this draft, right? So, so yeah, I expect, that's what I said the other day, Cole, uh, if I had to make a bet or put money down, I would say that we both trade up and trade down during this draft. And when I'm looking at like, okay, Jermaine Johnson might be there at 14. Would I rather have Jermaine Johnson or would I rather have like a Mafe or Epicati later and then add another starter or a potential, you know, long-term solution both this year and next year? I'm going to take Ebicady and the extra player. I said that with Gabe Ferguson a couple of days ago. So if you can um, trade back and get Booth and Ebicady, Ooh, right boy and you i'm looking at the crazy. saints i've been looking at the saints cole because they traded that made that trade with what philadelphia or whatever it yeah. was for for a reason they they probably want a quarterback so i'm in a position where i don't even know if i want two quarterbacks taken before us maybe a quarterback is still on the board when we're trading at four when we're on the clock at 14 and that opens the door for us to trade back and get an extra starter and a guy that's almost as good practically as good just in different ways as who we could take at 14. So one of my favorite trade backs, I'm just going to throw it out there not to keep running on the Cardinals might see some desperation to keep Kyler Murray. They just lost Kirk. Maybe, you know, a receiver falls, they jump up, we get their second rounder. You go back to 23 and pick up their second rounder. And then you have, I think it's 23, 45, and then 54, if I have it right. So that's good again, very, very good. And then you trade, 76 and get back up there or something so long yeah. you're, you're nailing it they have so much capital they can really move around the board and kind of make some things happen and cole after these the you know my barbecue is wrapping up here in a few days so after i make my list and get everything set that's that's the kind of the kind of stuff that i'm finally going to be able to dig into is looking at these teams and looking how we can maneuver the board right. so yeah so that's pretty interesting you're you, you know you're right they need a receiver and you're trying to well, keep Kyler happy. Well, all these happy. receivers should fall, right? Like Green Bay could move up. They got 22 and 28. Um, 
you know, there's there's quite a few teams that might jump up. There's Kansas City with two firsts. Um, maybe you kind of do some, you know, math there with the with the picks, and you go back right. to twenty nine and thirty. I, I don't know. It's uh, and you got Green Bay, of course. They 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 very well could take a yeah. receiver. And then with the 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 pick, the George Pickens and the Jahan Dotson, and whoever else is going to fall out of the first round, I'm not optimistic that a receiver is going to be taken before us. I mean, the odds say that one will be. The odds say that there's going to be a receiver in the first 13 picks. But if I'm those teams and I got an early second, I'm thinking maybe they prioritize this like it's you know it's kind of thin on the D line or whatever else they want to address and and just right. wait until the second round to get a receiver. So I could see that. That's a great point. Never thought of that. Maybe the maybe the Cardinals want to move up and Chris Olave or somebody they really like for their system. A lot of it there. makes so much sense to replace Christian Kirk. Like it makes perfect he? sense. Yeah, he do, he does. He does. A little better version, in my opinion, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. so yeah. But uh so anyway, Cole, we did pretty good, man. A little over an hour, but uh that's 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 just the way the ball bounces, G. As a wise man named Flavor Flav once said, that's just the way the ball bounces, G. So we got Canadian barbecue, we got beers, beers chilling outside. We got you gotta have the outside right. Maybe an awning even to protect yourself. There it is. We're we're getting we're getting everything. Cole, not a city slicker, moving more towards the the outer edges of society, uh, in the in the country out there as he's aging, getting older. Great information. Cole, I think I'm gonna make a cut up of it. Always got the little girl close to me. And, and there's Scarlett. <laughs> yeah, that's that's his reason why. And she looks much different now from the <laughs> videos that I've seen. She's growing up getting out there you know stretching out our legs and going for walks and all that other stuff man so proud papa yeah we could trade we could trade that stories all day so i'll spare the people that so with that i'd like to say thank you to my football family love my football family know y'all enjoyed cole please follow his work two guys watching football youtube channel uh want to make sure i plug that and of course the work that cole and mostly james did when james's uh draft guide red star baltimore do yourself a favor and check that out. Uh, I'll be going through it again, Cole, and this next week is I'm finally done and being able to enjoy everybody else's work. So, you know, Cole, God bless you, and I really appreciate you coming on, being part of the family as always, and uh, just helping me out with this series. So um, with that, Cole, this is where we say goodbye to the people. Say goodbye to people, Cole. Goodbye, people. Love y'all. <laughs>